Hello, everybody. Welcome to this month's Future in Space Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell, and I am with the DeepAstronomy.com website. And these hangouts are something we do every month to get you introduced into the future in space. Now, I know that's not a surprise because that's the name of the hangout, but we want to introduce you to all kinds of new things, not just about uh, space telescopes and, and, and the science, but also we want to go into human space flight as well. Uh, so the whole gamut, every, everything's free, or everything's free game, I guess, or whatever you want to call it for, for these hangouts. And so today I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about what I think is one of the most interesting areas of uh, astronomy and uh, science and, and the study of our universe, which, are, which is low temperature astronomy. And we have, uh, we, have some real, we have some experts in the field that are going to help us discuss this, but NASA has begun a series of studies of four concepts, and we're going to be talking about one of them tonight uh, to look at uh, these, this area of the spectrum that is very interesting both scientifically and, uh, and uh, just just for getting our space, our, our <laughs> yeah. So just so uh, we're going to be we're going to be diving into that pretty much in depth. But before I get started, let me introduce my co-host, Dr. Harley Thronson. He is an astrophysicist at, at the NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. How are you doing, Harley? Doing well. Good evening, Tony. Uh, just for for our guests, you know, Tony is uh, is in the UK. Yes, I'm in the UK. It is now. Eight o'clock uh, my time, uh, eight p.m. and it has been the these working this schedule is always very challenging because my workday starts about two p.m. and it ends around around uh, ten eight or ten p.m. So it's an interesting schedule to have. But yes, so I'm currently in the UK. Um, and I want to I, I want I'm, before I introduce our guests for tonight's hangout, I want to let you know that one of the reasons Harley and I do these things every month is we want to not only just bring you these topics and ideas and and missions to your attention, we would like we want you to ask questions, we want your feedback, we want your interaction, and so uh, in the best way to do that is to really convenient ways to do it. One of them is if you're watching this on YouTube, which most of you end up doing, uh, there's a chat window, a live chat going on right now uh, where you can leave your comments and questions and I will be scanning that throughout the Hangout and I will read them out or ask your questions uh, to our guests as they, uh, as they come up or if, I do, if they're, not, they're not quite relevant to the topic we're talking about that minute, then I may wait until towards the end of the Hangout to read them out. So uh, that's one way you can do it. Another one is, you see on my lower third, oh, I am not big, Harley's big. I keep forgetting I am the director of these things. So the, uh, the that my Hangout is right there, um, uh, or my hashtag, Future in Space. If you tweet on that, I'll be monitoring that as well, looking at the... Um, looking at the uh, Future in Space Hangout tag. And finally, we have a Future in Space at, deep, at deepastronomy.com email address, which I'm also looking at. So please send us your comments and questions there and uh, let us know uh, what you think and we'll get involved because that's one of the reasons we're here. So let me, without further ado, let me get, uh, let me get started. My guest today uh, is Dr. Dave Lysowitz. He's, uh, he's, a, um, he's at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and he is uh, the NASA study scientist for the Far Infrared Surveyor. Hi, Dave. Welcome. Hi, Tony. Hi. Well, glad to have you on board. And also joining me is Dr. Margaret, Margaret Meixner. He, she is the, an astronomer astrophysicist at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. How are you doing, Margaret? I'm doing great. Uh, great. So I didn't get a chance because you joined right before we started to, to get your title. Why don't you tell us what you do at the Institute? Uh, okay, well, on this uh, Far Infrared Surveyor thing, I'm one of the community chairs. Okay. Um, so I'm a member of the astronomical community in this capacity, and um, I'm here to help lead the study in my cohort, and that is Asantha Kure, who is at uh, University of Irvine. Great. All right. So welcome to both of you. So uh, Harley, why don't you give us a little bit of background on our topic today from a scientific perspective. We were talking before the Hangout started that, uh, and, and Dave was telling us that this was uh, something that was, it wasn't part of the uh, decadal survey, which is a different thing astronomers do, but it was part of something else called the Astrophysics Roadmap, 
which I don't fully know what that is, but why don't you give us a little bit of background on the, the science? Sure. We don't want to bore the audience. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. So, uh, very simple. Um, oh, a, about a year and a half or so ago, uh, NASA headquarters, um, looking toward the 2020 um, National Academies Decadal Survey, concluded that it is time to start thinking about the larger astrophysics missions that will follow the James Webb Space Telescope. We've had speakers on this series on that. And uh, the W first mission, we all, all, have also had speakers on that mission. Um, James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which we will be covering again, uh, will be launching in 2016 and W first um, in the middle of the next decade. It takes time to develop the technology and the science, the community support for these missions, and NASA has got that process underway. Um, the uh, NASA uh, selected two, con I'm sorry, four concepts for study, which, uh, each of which we'll be covering in turn. This is the first one. Um, in this case, a, um, a mission which, which uh, Dave and Margaret are leading and um, I'll introduce them in their different capacities. In this case, a mission to observe um, some some very important, very very important um, scientific physical processes in space um, that can only be observed from space and can only be observed and understood from the wavelengths of the missions that Margaret and um, and hey, welcome Tony. Um, that Margaret and David. Hi, Alberto. Are meeting. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> are you in a? He's on his Apologies, Margaret. Yeah. Dave, this happens when you deal with Alberto. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, on a phone, I'm on a phone in my car. I just finished what I had to do at the. Air oh, Force I thought you were in your private jet because we yeah, know that you know you have your own yeah. Gulfstream. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I wish. We, we had. I had plenty of time, Margaret, to warn Dave about about the way we operate. Margaret, welcome to Hangouts. Uh, <laughs> and then, well, so, and then, so, so uh, NASA headquarters um, identified four major mission concepts that they want studied in depth between now and about 2020 when the National Academies will assess them all. They are all very impressive. They're all very exciting. They all have, uh, they all have a very impressive science team and study team leading them. This is the this is the first of the series of four that we will be discussing. Um, so that's some some context. Um, this is a field I used to work in. However, uh, Margaret and Dave, which is the reason they're here, are the experts. Right. Uh, so um, I want to set the stage for this a little bit, though, because we all know that we've talked to, you know we've talked about JWST several times on this, and Alberto's here now, so he can also comment on it a bit more. But, uh, uh, and Hubble, Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope are both considered primarily uh, infrared telescopes. Hubble also does other wavelengths; they do optical and UV. But the uh, but J and James Webb is going to be doing the near infrared. Uh, but we're talking about the next layer. We're talking about longer wavelengths than that, aren't we? And and so um, maybe Dave, I could get you to comment a little bit on the Far Surveyor mission itself and the kind of wavelengths it's going to be seeing, and maybe some kind of follow up on that and how it compares. With JWST, sure. Or Tony, it does. Um, that's a terrific question. Um, so the entire electromagnetic spectrum spans the range from gamma rays to radio waves, and it's partitioned into um, convenient blocks. So there are gamma rays and radio waves. There's also ultraviolet and visible light, um, X rays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it so happens, as a matter of convenience that the far infrared, well, the infrared part of the spectrum actually has been subdivided by the astrophysics community um, into chunks itself, uh, one of which is near infrared, and another of which is mid infrared, and another of which is far infrared. So these are all very subtle things that probably most people online won't care so much about, but um, they're useful partitions in terms of the kinds of things that we see in the universe and study in the universe at these different parts of the spectrum. And so it's true that Hubble actually gets out into the near infrared and James Webb will get into the mid infrared. Um, and the far infrared surveyor mission that we're here to discuss today goes to even somewhat longer wavelengths than what James Webb will do. So James Webb goes to approximately 30 microns, micrometers of wavelength, 
and um, beyond that, at longer wavelengths from, let's say, approximately 30 microns to maybe 600 microns, still to be decided by our team. Um, all of that <clears throat> is what we would call far infrared. Okay, I'm finding myself wishing I had one of those electromagnetic spectrum charts up there so people could kind of follow along, but, you know, the the uh, the near infrared is around one one micron or so, and down, and uh, I guess down to two or maybe five, and then the uh, and then, as you were saying, the mid infrared goes down to about 30 microns, which is where JWST is going to live. But we're going even further back than that. So, Margaret, can you help us understand a little bit about the science and the observations that get done in these different regimes in the IR and the IR? Like, are they do does each, each one? I'm I'm sure has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, can you give us some sense of what the far IR gives us that the near and the mid don't? Uh, absolutely, right. Um, so if you think about what Hubble sees, um, Hubble sees stars and, um, and in galaxies, uh, galaxies are composed of stars and stuff we call in between the stars, the interstellar medium, and that's gas and dust. And the far infrared, um, and J so JWST is going to be studying kind of warm dust and uh, sort of red shifted stars because as you go back further in time, things get red shifted and JWST is going to see some of the very first galaxies, but kind of the stars in those galaxies. But what about that gas and dust in between the stars? What about that? Well, that's going to require a longer wavelength mission because things are even more redshifted. You're going to need something longer wavelength in order to pick up what is happening with all the stuff from which stars are made, and that's the interstellar medium. And that will be the bread and butter of so any kind of far infrared surveyor mission. You're going to need um, to study that that wavelength range to study the gas and dust locally in our universe, but even more importantly, when you go to the high redshifts, um, you'll you'll need um, those wavelengths. And so it's a very key um, wavelength range to study why things are happening in the universe because it's the origin of things. Okay, I want to get to some. Of, I, I'm, I want to talk about some of the specifics of the telescope itself a little bit later on. But before I go too much further, I want to. I want to I want to go to this idea that you said okay so the the bread and butter is going to be the interstellar medium the stuff in between the stars that from which stars are born one of the advantages and Alberto is is driving so I don't necessarily want him to be like going too far in in this but but as I understood the I can infrared, hear you I can't hear you okay you can't you can okay because we're watching you I, I watch you suddenly swerve. <laughs> Going okay. fine. <laughs> I'm glad, boy. You can really multitask. That's something. Um, so the the, um, the one of the justifications for JWST and then the mid-range IR telescope, one of its bread and butter, is going to be the fact that the it will look at these really old first stars and galaxies because the universe has expanded and redshifted. The light from those galaxies were actually in the ultraviolet when they started, but by the time they get to us, they've been redshifted into the infrared. Will these wavelengths, these wavelengths, these these far infrared late wavelengths, show us any of that, or are we only talking about gas and dust? Maybe I have to analyze that to date. It would be primarily the gas and dust. Okay. So one possible way to think about this is that um, if you look at the light from any arbitrary galaxy. Um, it has two big humps in its spectrum, two brightness peaks. One is the starlight peak that Margaret was alluding to, and the other is the interstellar gas and dust peak that Margaret was also referring to. Um, those are two separate peaks in a way. And then if you look deep into the universe, there's the redshift effect that you're mentioning. And so the starlight peak gets shifted toward the kinds of wavelengths that JWST will see but the interstellar dust and gas peak gets shifted to even much longer wavelengths. Okay, just, oh, Margaret has something up uh, here now. Let me, let me just switch to her. Ah, okay, good. Thank you for this. Oh, this is so nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this. I was always <laughs> dying for this graphic. Um, okay. This is what we're talking about, folks. So you can see right here all three of these ranges uh, outlined here in microns. This is perfect. Thank you, Margaret. Um, and so... The visible light you can see right over there in the in the little rainbow section, and then you even see the uh, the telescopes that have been seeing this range. The Spitzer is the current king of the infrared right now, uh, watch, doing that whoppingly huge uh, wavelength range there. 
Um, but while so Dave, so let, let me just clarify something. The JWST is going to be working between say I don't know five and 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 forty microns or thirty microns. Was if the universe is just a hypothetical question? If the universe had expanded some more, if it was older, would those first stars be in the <coughs> long wavelengths, or would they we still not be seeing the stars at all yet? Um, in principle, if the universe had expanded even more than it has by a large factor, um, then the starlight could be shifted all the way into the far infrared. But okay. in fact, we know how much redshift there is possible in the universe, um, okay. and it's not that much. Okay, so um, in these, so we're look, so in these wavelengths. So I have a couple of images that you sent. Also, let me grab, um, let me grab. So the. And JWST this, for reference is between 0.6 and 2.8 microns. Say that again, Alberto. 0.6 to 2.8. That's JWST. That's not the range of wavelengths. Oh, right. Okay. 0.6 to 28 microns. Okay. Yes, to, what did I say? 0.6 to 28. Right. Yeah. So, so it'd be like from the R band in that image I sent you all the way through, you know, 24 or something like that. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. So with the the so. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of science that we are hoping to get out of the interstellar medium, the 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 lo these longer wavelengths. Now, Margaret already talked, gave us some uh, the 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 bread and butter is going to be the the interstellar medium, the gas, the dust, the things that kind of I, I don't know glow, I guess for lack of a better word. Um, what kind of telescope do you need for that? I mean, do you need a big mirror? Do you do you just you know how would you I mean, I can imagine a gas and a cloud of gas and dust not having defined detail, really. So, do you need a large mirror for re resolution, Dave uh, or Margaret? Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, astronomers can, are greedy here. Ahead. We, unshare we always bit. want. Uh, I don't know how to unshare. Let's see. Just click on the. Um, there should be a thing saying "stop" at the top of your Hangout window. Stop it. Or just click the, the share again. Click the share again. Or you could just click the green share button again. Oh, there we go. There you go. Right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I, astronomers are gr always greedy here. I mean, we would like That's really what Carol the, largest, the <laughs> largest mirror you can get, so you could get the highest definition. Um, and uh, you also want it large because you get to be very sensitive uh, to see things that are very far away or very faint locally. Um, so. Uh, yeah, and so what constrains us are, is what technology can do for us. Um, but you you need a large mirror or something large in order to uh, for for both types of sciences that you'd want to do with this. You want to be able to see things that are uh, far away but unconfused. Because at the moment, uh, the last observatory that went up to study this Herschel, everything is confusion limited. It's sort of a mass of galaxies all conglomerated, and it's hard to differentiate how many there are. And they've made attempts at that, but it's still hard to know, um, to be able to count them, if you will. There's that counting issue. Um, but locally, um, people are wanting to look at more and more detail at the formation of solar systems. And this is another science area that something like a far infrared surveyor type mission uh, could weigh in on. Okay, um, I want to get to that in a minute because I have some images from Dave to show that. But it, you just mentioned this, this business about everything being confused. Is that because of this? What I'm yeah. showing now, click on my thumbnail and you can see it bigger. Um, is that because of this where you, in the, I don't know if, if the viewers can see this because of all the thumbnails at the bottom, yeah, but in the lower it. corner this says the entire, the entire image here is Herschel's, the Herschel Space Telescope's field of view, which you were just talking about. But if you zoom way in on one tiny point right in here, what Hubble can see, you can see there's actually a lot of stuff in there. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. That's exactly that's, what I'm talking about. And that's very confusing to an infrared, far infrared telescope. Yes. Okay. So the far infrared surveyor then, w part of its design might be to what they're called deblending, because all of these galaxies are on top, are just sort of smashed on top of each other. So it would need to have a resolution that could deblend these. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Well, I just wanted to point that out because this is something that is a. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I don't know. What do you think about this? Can you hear me, Alberto? Yes, I can hear very well. So, is, J is JWST going to have this problem? The field of view of JWST is going to be comparable, isn't it, to Hubble? 
Yeah, but I think the wavelengths are, are the key. I think what Margaret was saying is that we're looking at kind of different wavelengths. So I think the confusion is, uh, the confusion limit is very different, right? Okay. All right. So it's not so much. But with... I, I actually, but I, I, wanted, I wanted to ask Margaret actually is, so but when you're thinking about size of telescope, you know, to get the resolution you want and then to go beyond, uh, you know, this confusion limit, so to speak. So what, what are you thinking beyond JWST? Are you thinking, you know, much, much larger or are you thinking a set of instruments looks different? Well, I mean, the resolution is determined by the telescope diameter, so right. it's it's the telescope, really. Um, how big? Uh, that's what our group's going to work on in the next year. Okay. So, yeah. so, 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 you know, earlier we sent, um, Dave sent to, uh, to Tony a couple of very early, more conceptual than anything, images of a couple of candidates to give the audience a bit of an idea of what's being thought about. Okay. Bring up and while you, by the way, uh, while you bring them up, one thing is it's still the case. I used to back when I was doing active research, I uh, used to work in the field that we're talking about now. And is it still the case? I remember one of the most interesting bits of information that roughly half of all the photons in the cosmos are are uh, found at the wavelengths likely to be addressed by the mission that Margaret and uh, and David are describing here. Uh, well, we have not redone your calculation, but yes. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> if, if, if you think about just purely what a what a galaxy looks like, you know, half half the light comes out at stars, some of it, and the the other half gets reprocessed by the dust emission and comes out in the far infrared. So just based on that simple two peak yeah. um, region of where the energy comes out, I think yes. That's not really going to change. It'll be approximately that. No, that yeah. Feel, feel free, to, re feel free to, uh, to reference my work from uh, 1989. Uh, send us the link. Feel free to reference my work. Okay, so I'm with the show, with the plug now. All right, so I, I have this up. Um, is this was this something you want, you wanted to talk about a little bit, Dave? I'd be happy to, okay. and we should really do a comparison of this with the other one. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So, um, this is a conceptual diagram illustrating uh, a what you might say is a conventional telescope. It doesn't look a little, it looks a little different than an ordinary telescope. That's because we moved the uh, so-called secondary mirror out of the way to give us a, a nice clean view of the sky. Well, it has a lot of similarities to another telescope I know about. Yeah, JWST. <laughs> uh-huh, that's no accident. Um, so exactly how big this is, as Margaret was saying, that's to be determined. Um, or whether we even build this kind of a thing is also to be determined. Um, I think the image just, uh, at least from my screen, um, collapsed down to a thumbnail size. I'm not sure if that's true for everyone. Can you maybe pull it up to its full screen again? Yeah. Do what? Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. oops, keeps jumping down down to thumbs. Oh, screen. click on my icon. It'll it'll stay big for you. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Yeah, okay. You now go. it's big. Um, so in parentheses here, I emphasize something that's going to be true no matter what we build, and that is that um, this thing would be extremely cold, and when I say extremely cold, the temperature of liquid helium, which is about 4 degrees Kelvin, 4 degrees above absolute zero. And the reason for that is that in the far infrared at these long wavelengths, um, everything glows. Anything that has a, a temperature that's not extremely cold glows brightly. So if you were to observe the sky uh, and try to make sensitive measurements with a warm telescope in the far infrared, mostly what you would be doing is collecting light from the telescope itself and hardly a little, just, just a little bit more from the universe. And of course what we really want to do is collect light from the universe and not be swamped by the, the fog of, of photons light from the telescope itself. So to accomplish that we make this telescope extremely cold. Um, exactly how cold, exactly how big, all those things are still to be determined, but cold. Um, now that would so be true of anything we build. I was, yeah, I was going to say, so approximately, you know, you're looking at an order of magnitude colder than JWST, roughly. Uh, yes, JW is about 40 degrees Kelvin, and this would be 4 Kelvin. Mm -hmm, correct. Right. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, um, Tony, can you display the, uh, the interferometer concept? Because this is an entirely different way of accomplishing some of our goals, um, potentially. So okay, let me click. OK, there, it's full screen. So now in this concept, you'll see what look like two telescopes on a stock that collects them. 
Um, those telescopes can be relatively small, and the, the benefit of an interferometer, and this idea has been in use actually for a century, ever it dates back to um, Albert Michelson about a century ago, who did some really amazing um, visible wavelength measurements with an interferometer. Um, you collect the light with relatively small telescopes, and if you can move those telescopes around, you can still make an image uh, that corresponds to what you would get from a telescope, that, a regular telescope, that's about as big as the separation between the little telescopes. Okay, so hang on just a sec. These, these two things sticking out on the sides, those are entire telescopes? Yes. Wow. Now, mm -hmm. I didn't appreciate that when I first saw the scale of this. Is, is must be enormous. Um, it can be. Yeah. Um, it will be whatever we need it to be, or maybe we won't even make this kind of a thing. That's all to be determined. But this is talking about that now. Point. Yeah. So this is the kind of a device that we would use if we were dominated in our science objectives by trying to achieve high resolution images, as opposed to extraordinary sensitivity. This would still give us good sensitivity because um, because the telescopes would still be very cold but it would be much less sensitive than a, a very large um, single regular telescope because the light collecting area of the telescope would be um, bigger or smaller. So is that the trade-off then? You've got a trade-off between resolution and sensitivity? Is that usually what you have to trade off? In, yes, in looking at these two alternative um, architectures for the, the mission, that is the main trade-off between sensitivity and resolution. Okay. And but in this architecture, in this architecture, you still have to cool the telescope to four Kelvin, correct? Well, I mean, you have to cool the entire system, or just uh, each each node. Um, each individual telescope would have to be that cold, and the um, instrument that combines the light that's located in the center of that image that also has to be about that cold. So and I'm not seeing any cold. shields here on this one, unless it's those back planes behind each uh, telescope. Where would something like this sit? I mean, we know why JWST is going out to the L2 point for a reason, and it's going to be it's a nice secluded spot, very very safe, very cold. Uh, mm -hmm. Where would you put this out there too? Yes, that's okay. a very very good place to go. And I should clarify that those things that look like sort of boxy, uh, shaved off rectangles around the uh, telescopes, those are actually multi-layer uh, sun shields. Okay. WST has its tennis court sized sun shield. So what would these be in comparison roughly? Can you give us an idea? In terms of size of the telescope? Yeah, how big would these be? Um, in this particular concept, in the picture you're looking at there, they would be one meter in diameter, but that's all adjustable um, according to how much sensitivity we would need. Yeah, okay. I'm sure how much money too. So that's and what's a typical separation? What's a typical separation? You have to Again in that particular configuration, yeah. just a concept, um it was thirty six meters. Okay. Oh, All right. So about a third of a football length for a third of a soccer field, depending on who's listening. Okay. So the <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things Margaret told us about earlier in the in the hangout was that we can do some really great things at these wavelengths. One of them is sort of get rid of the confusion of the universe, which one is always happy to do. Um, but you can also do things with early, um, early solar systems. And so let me put up this image. And Margaret, well, can you talk? I, I interrupted you when you were going there, so maybe you could pick up with uh, early solar systems and maybe tell me some of the science that you can do along those lines. Okay, so first let's ooh and ah over this beautiful image. Uh, ooh. This was made by... <laughs> ooh. Ah. That's what the whole astronomical community did when ALMA released this as a press release. ALMA is an interferometer. This is an ALMA the, image, then. This is an ALMA yes. image. Um, okay. And it covers... Uh, ALMA does cover some of the wavelength range, but not all, but only peeking through the atmospheric windows that uh, is allowed to the ground. Okay. Uh, the water vapor in our atmosphere... It's the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, and it's a ground-based... Yeah, let's, let's take a bit of a moment here. This is like a terrific, a mind-blowing image. Let's take a, take a moment, if you guys don't mind. Show them the image of Alma, just so the audience has uh, a... Uh, okay. An appreciation of... of You're going to drive this Internet, aren't you? So let's see here. Where'd it go? 
I can't do it. I'm actually driving a real car. I can't do that. Yeah, you, you know, you're worrying people, Alberto. You know that, right? They're worrying about you online. I'm seeing you know, that. You joined us. We found a nice thing. I hope today. Alberto's being safe, so use... Use I, have vo I, have vo I have voice, I have CarPlay, that's okay, I'm in Colorado, it's, it's fine, it's great. What do you mean you're, it's okay you're in Colorado? <laughs> what is it, they don't drive well in Colorado? I, mean, I don't understand the, no, the it's, distinction. There's a lot of space. Hey, let's say, guys, let's, oh, let's a lot of focus, focus our thoughts here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here is the NSF ALMA, um, NRAO, ALMA website, and there you can see the array, and, and it's been years since I was familiar with this, so either Margaret... Or um, or David, no, go back up to the go back up I'm to the. Trying to find a better picture is all. That's but, not bad. All right. Not bad. All right, we'll leave it there. Yeah. So that this is an interferometer, kind of like what Dave said, but it's it, it's got, going to have up to sixty four dishes. Uh, of course, we have the the Earth's surface to help lay them out on, and that um, makes it um, makes it feasible to do this many. Um, and uh, this is a very revolutionary international ground-based telescope starting at, if you think about the microns, kind of starting out about 400 <coughs> microns, 450 microns, going all the way out to millimeters, three millimeters. Um, and it, so it's also uh, sensitive to the dust and the gas, the interstellar medium aspects. And what you're seeing in that image Tony showed at first was um, basically the dust disk. Around a Can young. Go back to thing. it. Sure. Okay. I'm keep going. I'm, I'll get there. Around the young planet forming um, system called HL Tau, and Tau is for Taurus, so it's in the constellation of Taurus. Okay. Um, but the structure you see there is um, where the dust is located, and you can see that there's sort of rings. Yep. And what astronomers think in those gaps where it's dark is that there may be a planet and they're kind of clearing it out. Sort of like when we look at the rings of Saturn, so there are moons of Saturn that are clearing out and causing structure in the rings. There are planets causing structure in this disk around this for, uh, forming and planet forming star. Oh, wow, this is amazing. And, what is, well, and Margaret, what's the scale, what's the size that we're looking at here for this object? This? Oh, wow. Well, the size of like the Kuiper belt and stuff is... Um, you know, it's reaching out beyond what would be our Kuiper belt in our solar system. I mean, that's so the, size the, of that disk. So the so the uh, uh, so um, this is way way larger than our own solar system. Oh oh, by by factors, yes, oh. maybe a factor of ten. I mean, it's much much bigger. This is something that's forming. Our solar system right. is very right. mature. It's gotten rid of a lot of the stuff that one sees here through ejection or forming the planets or the gas evaporates. But this is a disk that has both gas and dust. It's very heavy and thick, and planets are just starting to form. So this is the kind of object, this is a brand new solar system being born, uh, coalescing from the dust and the gas in the area. The star is already, is already going, and now the planets are starting to form, and they're sweeping out these concentric circles that we see in this disk, right? At least that's what you think is going on here. Correct. Yes. Okay. So, and this is the kind of thing that that is going to be very bright at these wavelengths. Oh yes. Oh yes. I mean, so this well, is I can another see now, thing. Looking at this that. image, why resolution is important. Um, what would sensitivity get you, though, Dave? Looking at you said sensitivity is important too. Hey, what, what um, you a brighter image. Guys, I have to hang off because oh. I got to go to a, another. Another okay. reading. So All I apologize right. for kind of dropping in and out, but next time, uh, now that I know how to get on, I'll be on for longer. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, Margaret. I appreciate it. Okay. That was Margaret Brinkson from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Bye. Just hit the, bye -bye. Just hit the uh, hang up button there or the hang up red telephone and you're, you'll be Perfect. Gone. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Okay. We can make up a bunch of stuff oh, now. Great. Now I can say anything I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, actually, let me make a note of why, I mean, one of the reasons that Margaret, of course, is no less true than anybody else here, and certainly David, is that just the way, before you go back to HL Tau, and I don't want to leave it yet, um, the way that these studies are structured is that Margaret is co-leading a group of, what is it, about a dozen scientists from around the world, actually, mainly in the U.S., because this is a NASA study. Closer um, to 20, Harley. What's that? Closer to 20, but that's okay. Closer to 20, that sounds fine. Um, 
So Margaret is co-leading them. They represent the science interest, the science community, and so on. Um, and so over the next few years, they're going to be looking at various designs for this mission, um, examples, two of which we saw earlier. Um, the, the science goals, uh, which will, of course, determine what the mission will look like. Um, and then Dave is at Goddard Space Flight Center leading the study team, engineers and technologists and also scientists at Goddard, that will be turning what, the, what Margaret's team would um, dream of doing into some kind of engineering and technical reality. So it's a, it's, a, it's a nice mixture of both what NASA can do at a place like Goddard Space Flight Center and what the science community around the U.S. and with some international participation um, can do to lead um, the, the definition of these missions. So there you go. So sorry, uh, uh, a role, uh, enlargement on the role of what Dave and, and Margaret do. But, okay. but I don't think we're yet ready to leave HL Tass. I, I just wanted to, I just was going to go back to this. So we got a couple of questions about this image that I want to bring up while, while uh, Dave maybe gives us some comments on it. We're getting a question like, uh, let's see, from um, uh, Star Mole is, is saying, is the center bit a sun? It looks like a huge relative to the planetary rings and um, and there was another question of, and I don't know from who about how far away this system is so Dave can you give us a little of the details about do you know anything about this particular yeah, system um, I wish I had read up on the numbers and all the details ahead of time um, just like when I was a kid I used to be able to tell you the distance yeah, I, I know from the sun. Um, I, I won't know all those details um, off the top of my head but um, okay. certainly if you Google HL Tau, um, you'll find an awful lot of those details online. Um, so I'll do my best. Um, so that that bright spot in the middle here, um, it's certainly true that there is indeed a star in the middle of, of this um, system. However, at these wavelengths, uh, by ALMA, uh, that is not what you're looking at here. So the bright spot in the middle of this image is still essentially dust, glowing dust. Um, so the star itself on this scale would be a tiny little speck, but it's not visible in this picture. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, by the way, I was just looking it up on the web. I, I knew next to nothing about HL Tau. It's about 450 light years away um, from, um, from us. Widely believed, as, as Margaret was talking about, that there are planets in the process of formation, forma uh, forming in those gaps, sweeping up the material and producing the, um, the gaps, uh, that the, the bright object in the center probably, that bright thing in the center is unresolved. It's not the star, but it is, uh, um, uh, it is relatively warm dust in the immediate vicinity of the star. So oh, the whole thing is, is heated by that central star, uh, but you are not, uh, this, this is not um, actually imaging or resolving the star, probably maybe resolving uh, the large um, inner disk of dust around the central star. Right, and that's, that's, that's sort of goes to what, uh, there was a comment here from Astro Girl one usa Hi, welcome, by the way. I'm always glad to see you in the chat, so welcome. I'm glad you're back. She's making a comment about it, that it looks like that at least four planets are forming. And what's in that, while that may be possible, what, what's a little deceiving here is we're not looking at this fully resolved yet. So there could be a lot, I, I'm, there's a, there actually a lot more concentric lines, and if each or rings, and if each one of those is a planet, it'd be way more than that. And I think... To uh, you know, speaking speaking to uh, Dave's point, I think that you know we need more resolution to be able to see systems like this in more clarity. But can we go back to the? I, I still, I, and if you answered the question while I was looking at other things, my apologies, Dave. But what I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around this um, idea of uh, the trade-off between resolution and um, oh shoot, I forgot the word now. What was the, what was the other? Yeah, thank, thank you. Sensitivity. What would this image look like if would it be more? Would it, if it were more sensitive, would we just see a brighter disk, or how would that translate? Um, conceivably, if there were more rings, even outside the diameter of the largest ring that you see here, uh, you can tell that the faintness, uh, the the brightness drops off as you go farther and farther away from the star. Probably because the dust is cooler and cooler as you go farther away. Um, so potentially, if there was more material out there, a more sensitive telescope would detect that. 
Um, so this is a really nice image to um, to think about when you contemplate that trade-off that you're referring to between okay. resolution and sensitivity. So let me try to pick up on that point, if I may. Sure. Okay. Um, so as Harley mentioned, um, this object is about 450 light years away, which might sound like a pretty large distance, but in fact that's in our cosmic backyard. So if you were to take this object and move it to, let's say, 10 times its distance, where certainly if you go 10 times farther away, you'll see many more of these objects. Um, this happens to be a relatively very nearby one. Um, if you take it farther away, it's going to be smaller in the sky. Um, just like anything, you know, the farther away it gets, the smaller an angle it subtends. And so uh, you would need higher resolution to be able to make a picture even like this, you would need 10 times higher resolution if the object were 10 times higher, farther away. So resolution is really key if you want to be able to see structure like this, or as you were pointing out, Tony, if you wanted to see even finer scale structure than you can see in this image. Um, now, another thing that, um, let's think about the sensitivity for a moment. Um, so this is the kind of observation that um, where, you know, if this were the, the key driving science for the mission, um, resolution would be really, really critical. The galaxies that we were looking at earlier, um, well, yes, resolution is important in order to distinguish one galaxy from another, but there you need extraordinary sensitivity because those galaxies are far, far, far away. Um, so both factors become very important in that case. Um, and maybe one more thing to point out is um, when you think about the dust that you're looking at here in this um, protoplanetary disk, um, that, uh, this is a, a measurement made at roughly a millimeter of wavelength by ALMA. Um, these objects, the dust in, in this system, glows most brightly at the far infrared wavelengths that we're talking about here, rather than in the, um, the one millimeter range that ALMA is sensitive to. So th this same object would actually be quite a bit brighter in the far infrared, but we have nothing like this kind of resolution presently. Okay. Well, can we go, before I leave this image, you've got a caption on here. I think you put it on here. Where's the water in this protoplanetary dip? What are you referring, what is that reference to? Uh, that's a really good question. Because I that, figured it because it was written on the yeah. image. That's how I knew I yeah. could ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly this is a measurement that we can make today with ALMA. So it's been made. It's really exciting. Um, it's probably true that ALMA won't be able to make a very large number of measurements like this. This one happens to be a relatively nearby object. Nevertheless, what ALMA is looking at, as Margaret mentioned earlier, is dust. And dust is good and interesting. It shows us where these gaps are and where planets might be. But if you want to ask a question like, when planets form, how do they become habitable? Then you might be interested in where the water is. And you can't see that water from the ground because the atmosphere of our planet, thankfully, is full of good stuff for humans, um, but not such good stuff if you want to observe in the far infrared. So a lot of far infrared light, as Mar Margaret was mentioning, can't even penetrate our atmosphere. You have to go into space to see it. Um, and among the very important and interesting things that you can't see on the ground is water. So water makes spectral lines that we can map out in, the, um, in these far infrared wavelengths. And we would be able to map the distribution of water, whether it's in either the gas phase or frozen out onto dust grain surfaces um, in a system like this. So we expect that these systems would have some kind of a water reservoir. And as the system evolves and planets form, some of that water gets deposited on planets through a process that we only theorize about today uh, and speculate about, but we do know that somehow our planet wound up with some water. There are some good theories as to how it got here, um, colliding comets in the early days of the solar system, that sort of thing, but that's only a theory. Um, it would be very, very nice to be able to look at systems like this and know where the water is and how it winds up on the surface of a planet that then can become habitable. Right. Well, yeah, so the uh, the I want to now I want to, we're running out of time and I want to talk about the telescope itself. So you guys are right now planning this out amongst yourselves. You're you've got your astrophysics roadmap, you've got some your priorities and you're still deciding it sounds like the science objectives you want this mission to have, correct? Correct. 
Okay, so what are you able, are you at a point yet where any consensus is made, or is it way too early yet to talk about what this thing's going to look like? It's way too early, frankly. We only just started our study. We've now had maybe a couple of uh, team telecons and that sort of thing, so we're really just getting started. Okay. So, um, well... But, uh, but I think that's on, on, a con, on, you know, on a concept of the, of the telescope, but I think the science that you were describing is, you, I guess my question is, are you still arguing about the science? We are still arguing about the science. Um, I, I wouldn't really call it so much arguing. We're, pri we're going to sure. collect and then prioritize the science for the mission. Right, right. So certainly this is not, we've, it's not a subject that we've never given thought to before, so we're not starting literally with a clean slate. There's lots of good material that we can draw upon and we will collect more of it, um, but we are starting with the science. We're going to take a fresh yeah. look at the well, real, and the challenge there is that we, we have to be very visionary in our science thoughts because we're going to, we're planning a mission that will happen at the very earliest in the latter part of the next decade. So okay, we have that's to where you're going to my next question now. Okay. Yeah, that's why I asked that. Okay, good. All right. Well, so let's let me let me just ask you about that a little. Let me dig into that a little bit more. So with W first, for example, it was a an idea that was listed in the Decadal Survey. Number one, we want this thing, and then NRO gave some telescopes to make it possible, and then they came up with some some science cases for using it. And then NASA said only just this year that they yes, go ahead, we're going to do this mission. Now, are, is that something that you still have to look? I won't say I look. I say look forward to facetiously, <laughs> but is this something that you know NASA has got to bless at some point? Is it way too early yet? To, you're still making the science case then, and then NASA has to say, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. Yes, it all starts with the decadal survey, which is commissioned by um, the the um, sponsoring. Yeah, we talked about that on several hangouts. Yeah, foundation. So I'm not sure how how well acclimated your audience is to um to that process, but. It is a process through which the entire science community um, gets together and sets priorities. Um, NASA really just responds to those priorities, the, one, the ones that affect what we would do in space, um, and, and in this case in astrophysics. Um, so W first, if you take that as a for instance, um, the way it got into the last decadal survey as a recommendation and a prior priority um, was because the science community recognized the importance of the science that it could do and the possibility, the technical feasibility of the mission. And through that endorsement process of the decadal survey, once it was prioritized, then NASA said, okay, we're going we're to now think about how to do it. So we're at the early stages of that now for, um, for the Far Infrared Surveyor. We're going to prioritize the science. We're going to present a concept to the decadal, the next decadal survey, uh, in roughly 2019, 2020, that kind of time frame. And if we're so fortunate that this is prioritized by the next decadal survey, then NASA will come along and help it happen. Okay, so we're looking at early, the earliest. We've got some time ahead of us, and after all, this is future in space hangout, folks. So we're bringing it to you. Heard, you heard it about here. You heard about it here first. Uh, this mission coming up, which will let you, um, which will let you see some of the far infrared of the universe. And let me just uh, see if I can get to. Um, uh, Astro Girl One USA is commenting, and I have to agree. Man, I am amazed at what NASA gets done with so little money. Um, very, very true. Uh, very well said. I agree with that. Um, he's, uh, and Astro Girl One USA is also wanting to know about the uh, water. We did we we did talk about the water, didn't we, Astro Girl? I mean, are you okay with what we said about it, or do you have any more questions? Because I think we got to that after you made that that comment. But if you need more, let me know in the comments here, and I'll I'll ask again, and we can talk about it. Um, what's a frost line? This, this, that's come up several times. Sean Huggins is asking about a frost line. Which I think you must have asked. Do you know? Can you tell me what that? I don't know what that is. What is that? Sure. Sometimes it's called a snow line or a frost line. So if you could maybe pop that image back up again, the prototype. Which one? Uh, this um, one, the one we showed. Yep. Okay. Um. That one. Great. Okay. Yep. So somewhere in that, uh, you could draw a concentric circle um, at at some location beyond which um, water was frozen. So we know what the temperature. Oh, oh, that's a fro okay. okay, sure, that's sure. Frost line. Okay. So outside of that, the water is frozen, and inside of that, it's melted and gaseous. 
that has the blind into space. And that's the kind of thing Alma can't see very well, but a, because of the atmosphere being in the way, but the, a, a space telescope would be able to pick up. A far infrared telescope would see water in its, right. both of its forms, both oh, gas, gas phase water and frozen water. So we would be able to directly measure where that um, snow line is, um, or frost line. And not only that, we would just learn an awful lot about how those habitable conditions can form, how habitable planets can form. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. That was a really good question. I'm glad I followed up with that then. So, all right. I think we've gotten to most of the comments there. Um, uh, let's see. Um, excuse me, but I thought NASA got billions of dollars. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, well, they also have billions of things they want to do. That's right. So, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, so much science, so, uh, so little money. Yeah, it's huge. Okay, I just want to do a quick, um, quick look at the uh, future in space thing. I didn't see. Okay, so I'm not seeing anything here. Okay. Well, I think I got to most of your comments and questions. I want to thank you guys for participating. Um, Alberto, do you have any comments you'd like to make on this when you're suave? Well, you look, you look like you're just chilling out wherever you... I'm chilling out. I'm in Colorado for a conference, yeah, and I was driving yeah, back. I'm in Colorado Springs. Ah, okay. You say menace driving down the Colorado highways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Pl I love the uh, future in space so much. Uh, it doesn't matter where I am. And my phone was at LT, so I was able to drive and listen to you guys. It was very interesting. Actually, I'm really looking forward. I thought what Dave described as the process, the, the kettle process, is very important to talk about because I think uh, you know, we're really looking forward to. Uh, you know, to sort of science, you know, being at the top priority regardless of what it is, and NASA implemented, uh, Hubble was chosen like that, and so was JWST, and so was W4. So it's a it's a very very healthy process that uh, you know that makes me proud to be an astronomer because I think we fight it out, if you will, uh, for the science, for the best science. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> it's a good, impressive process. All I got to say is I want your data plan. I don't know what you got, but I need to. I need that. Data. <laughs> 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 okay, so Dave, can you give us some sense what's next? We're gonna I'm gonna close up with this. What's next for the where are I mean you guys are still working you've already said you're working out the science goals. What's next for you guys? What's the next big milestone in this uh, mission? Okay, sure. Um so the the general process, if you will, is to start with those key science questions, uh and maybe even some secondary science questions, and each one of them um we'll have to think about, okay, how are we going to answer those questions? How can a far infrared mission help to answer the questions? What measurements in particular would you make? And from those measurements, you need to learn something about what instruments you would design and things like what, what resolution do you need, image resolution, what spectral resolution, what sensitivity, uh, what field of view size, how much of the sky do you need to cover? So those things come second after the science questions are prioritized. And then once we have a set of um, measurement requirements for the mission, we'll turn those into a mission concept. And for our purposes in this study, we don't have to have a very well-defined, um, highly engineered mission concept. We have to be able to demonstrate that the technology is going to be ready in the right time scale and that it's possible to make such a thing, whatever it is that we dream up, that we would make the measurements with. Okay. So that's as far as we need to get to well, I expect it, yeah, I expect to have you I expect to have you back. Will you come back and talk to us more yeah. as you guys make more uh, milestones? Very gladly, it would be a pleasure. Awesome. Well, great. Thank okay. You. Well, good. Well, I'm gonna go ahead. Let me just uh, I'm gonna go on, gonna go ahead and stop it there um, because we're running out of time. I want to thank you all for the great comments. Um, at Star Mole is going. Enjoy the UK, Tony. Welcome from a fellow Brit. Thinking about buying my first telescope tomorrow because of the Deep Astronomy Channel, dude. That makes my day. Thank you for making wow. that great comment. Uh, and Astro Girl One USA, absolutely. Buy a reflector, you get more bang for your buck. But that is the topic of another hangout. <laughs> That's right. So thank you all for the great comments. I appreciate this. And uh, this is a monthly thing. Third Friday of every month, we do these hangouts. Uh, future in space. And next month, though, we may have a special one. Harley, you want to tell us what may be coming up? Well, without? Well, it's well, super well, secret. One uh, of them. Super secret. Don't super say. <laughs> so let's just, just keep keep watching this space. Watch uh, Tony's social media sites. Uh, Deep not Deep absolutely Deep. sure, but there are some interesting rumors we're, we are following up on. But in any case, the on the third Friday of next month, I know my apologies, 
I don't remember which mission, which study we'll be talking about, but it will be one of the other four, one of the other three Great. Uh, yeah. studies that NASA has underway. Okay, great. So we look forward to seeing you guys again. Alberto, thanks for joining in. I appreciate your dedication. And uh, I, I, like I said, I, it's impressive. Keep, driving. Keep your yeah. eyes on the road. <laughs> impressive. Impressive. No, I'm not on the road anymore. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually on the road. I'm in the park right now. I was just stopped at Mega Deal Hotel. So I'm good. <laughs> okay, well, enjoy your dinner. And it uh, looks wonderful there. Enjoy, enjoy Colorado. All thank right. You. Well, thank you. So on behalf of uh, Alberto Conti and uh, Harley Thronson, I want to thank, want to thank my guest, Dr. Dave. Uh, Dr. Dave Lysowit. I have to look at my paper to make sure I get it right. That's uh, fine. From Goddard. So thank you all. Thank you all for taking the time out to join us. We'll see you guys next month. Uh, we also have our Footsteps to Mars hanging out on the first Friday of every month, so we will look forward to that as well. Thank you all for watching, and as always, keep looking up. Thanks. <laughs>